So I've been charged with um, a very narrow topic, which is really how do you select and stage people with perihilar glandular carcinoma for liver transplantation. And so we have a large experience with this uh, approach, having started a protocol in 1994 in the country. So I, I do want to highlight the fact that there are three different types of glandular carcinoma. As the previous speakers have mentioned, there's intrahepatic glandular carcinoma, which is never ever a consideration for liver transplantation. In fact, is a contraindication of liver transplantation. So this is confusing. I received two phone calls this week, actually, from people around the country wanting to transplant intrahepatic CCA. There's perihilar glandular carcinoma, which is a uh, indication. And then there's distal glandular carcinoma, which of course does not require liver transplantation because because it can be addressed by other surgical approaches. The UICC 7th classification now separates perihilar from distal in their definition of extrahepatic glandular carcinoma. Perihilar glandular carcinoma um, has often been misclassified as intrahepatic glandular carcinoma in many of the staging systems. And there's a recent nice paper in the journal Hepatology showing how common this is actually in the registry. So the, the problem is perihilar glandular carcinoma uh, often will invade hepatic parenchyma, but that does not make them intrahepatic disease. So here's a series of MRIs and the MRCP showing that this is really sort of a left hepatic duct glandular carcinoma, even though it does involve hepatic uh, parenchyma. And I'll also make the other point that was just made that there is an increase in incidence of intrahepatic glandular carcinoma in people with liver disease. So the major risk factor for intrahepatic glandular carcinoma that we recognize is cirrhosis from hepatitis B, hepatitis C, NASH, and they, these are also risk factors for perihilar glandular carcinoma. And there's a nice paper by Tushar Patel also recently in the journal Hepatology showing the odds ratio uh, for these. So if you, just because a patient has uh, cirrhosis does not mean that the mass is absolutely a given. That's, a, that's a HCC. In this narrow topic, um, I'll show you our criteria that we established several years ago for liver transplantation was that the mass had to be unresectable, it had to be perihilar. I'll show you this, how we look at the size of the lesion. And we consider all, all cancers in PSC to be unresectable for the following reasons. The patients often have fibrotic or advanced stage liver disease. It's usually a field defect, so if one looks for dysplasia, one finds it in the contralateral side. Patients often doing a ruin Y loop up to damaged bile ducts uh, usually invites problems with further cholangitis. And so we consider all cancers in PSC to be unresectable. I actually don't really believe this Japanese system of periductal infiltrating and mass forming glandular carcinomas. I think they're just spectrums of the same cancer. So these cancers actually have a tropism for bile. We showed several years ago that bile acids actually will transactivate the epidermal growth factor receptor. And so first they want to grow along the bile duct and they sort of, then that's the periductal infiltrating. And then as they acquire mutations, become more aggressive, they'll grow away from the bile duct and then you see a mass. So the periductal infiltrate is an earlier stage of the mass forming tumor. So it's very hard to really quantitate the dimension of a cancer along the bile duct. I don't think it makes any difference when it comes to transplantation. We don't try because that's an early stage disease. On the other hand, if it can start growing away from the bile duct, this is an advanced cancer. So if you see the mass, it's an advanced cancer. And then that we become very, very concerned about the aggressiveness and the biology of that cancer. And so there we have a cutoff of three centimeters. So we have no cutoff longitudinally along the bile duct, but we're very rigid about a three centimeter cutoff in the radial diameter for the cancer. Clangic carcinomas encase vessels by extrinsic encasement. They seldom invade. So if you look at the explants of these livers, you've, unlike HCC, which usually has a tumor thrombus in the vessel when you see loss of flow, uh, this is unusual in clangic carcinoma, though it can occur. Usually what they do is they sort of, by periductal encasement, inflammatory reaction, whatever, they encase the vessel. So encasement, it does not indicate tumor invasion, and encasement is not a contraindication to liver transplantation. Of course, vascular invasion with an HCC is a contraindication of transplantation, but this is not the biology of uh, clangic carcinomas.
These data have, uh, our approach has recently been verified by uh, Sarah Murad and, and other co-workers. And so, so what Sarah did was get a uh, successful grant from the ASLD, to which we will forever be indebted. And then she actually visited all the programs in the United States who had done transplantation for this disease and extracted the data herself. And so we, she visited all the programs who had done four or more cases. And we looked at the recurrence-free survival and, in fact, looked at this cutoff of a mass less than 3 centimeters or a mass greater than 3 centimeters. And so you can see that the five-year survival was roughly 75 to 80 percent of the mass was less than 3 centimeters in radial diameter. If the mass was more than 3 centimeters, the five-year survival was only about 30 percent. And so this cutoff uh, works, and we've now verified it externally. And if you have a little bit of intrahepatic metastases or satellite lesions or a perihilar lymph node that's positive, these are also absolute contraindications of transplantation. She also verified that. And so people within the criteria, again, had this uh, close to 80% five-year survival. People outside the criteria, again, had a less optimal outcome following transplantation. So what are the tools? The tools, of course, are MRCP, ERCP, percutaneous transhepatic cholangiograms, cross-sectional imaging, EUS with finding aspirate of regional lymph nodes. You can have functional imaging with PET, and you can actually look for bone metastases by traditional uh, technetium scans, and I'll just quickly run through this and, and how we employ them at our place. Invasive cholangiography, of course, is a requisite. We need to determine if it's truly unresectable. We need to visualize that. And direct cholangiography, I think, is still the gold standard. You often need a tissue diagnosis or cytologic diagnosis, so you need access to the bowel duct. Patients are usually jaundiced, and you need to relieve the cholestasis by stenting. We prefer endoscopic approaches over PTH. We've seen several people develop metastases at the site of uh, percutaneous tubes. And we've seen tracking along tube sites. And so clangic carcinoma, typically when it does metastasize, it metastasizes to the perineum and the mesentery. And so it's, it's a cancer that you can clearly seed. And I'll come back to that. By cross-sectional imaging, the MRI clearly uh, is better than CT, which is better than ultrasound in terms of looking at the mass. MRI is very good at looking um, for in, um, very good for looking at intrahepatic metastases. We do CTs to look for extrahepatic metastases. And we can, and the vascular encasement, we note, but we're looking for, if, to determine on resectability, but it's, it's not a contraindication to transplantation. This is a very difficult disease to diagnose, especially as in the periductal stage. And most of the patients that we see actually have PSC by tradition, and probably because they're patients who are under surveillance and the doctors have, uh, the referring doctors are concerned. So one of the questions we will we, we'll come back to is we do this, we do fluorescent situ hybridization with um, fish to make the diagnosis of polysomy. So we recently looked, we're in the process of looking at this group of PSC patients with suspicious cytology. And it turns out that if you have suspicious cytology, but your fish is negative, your chances of having cancer are are high, but not absolute. And so I have a large contingency of patients with suspicious cytology that I'm currently following. But if you have suspicious cytology with a positive fish, this is diagnostic of cancer, in my opinion. And we move on these patients now to a transplantation. So this was a patient with PSC with suspicious cytology, who, who then uh, we were following. And you will note that the ERCP really looks unchanged. She's not jaundiced. And the MRI clearly showed that this, she had a, a tumor in here with the segmental bowel duct obstruction. And so I would say that the cancers that I've missed in following patients with PSC, with suspicious cytology, is because I relied almost too extensively on just continuing to survey them by ERCP to follow the cytology without doing cross-sectional imaging. And I'm now starting to think that perhaps once they have suspicious cytology, it may be better just to follow them with cross-sectional imaging. And then if, if things change, go to the ERCP. The other tool is EUS and staging. So EUS is a great way to look for regional lymph node metastases, which most patients with hepatobiliary disease will have some lymphadenopathy, especially in the perihilar region, but this allows you to biopsy them by endoscopic ultrasound. So this is another imaging modality. There's no tip-off. This happens to show a lymph node with a hypoechoic region and a needle coming in, but there's really no tip-off in clangic carcinoma. So benign nodes will often have cancer, and malignant appearing nodes will often be benign. And so in, in a paper that uh, we wrote several years ago with uh, Fergus Gleason and colleagues, we found that there was no characteristic lymph node appearance. 
we had to biopsy them all. And the positive rate was about 17% in that study in patients who we did not think had extra hepatic metastases by CT and MRI. So it was useful. The role of PET scans is, is um, I think, unclear. So here's a, a young woman who had an obvious perihilar uh, cholangiocarcinoma, a very intense PET scan. All of her brushings in cytology were negative, and she was 26 years old, I think. So well, we wanted the PET scan, too. It was helpful diagnostically in her. These are data from Pierre Clavin, who's been doing CT PET in Zurich, Switzerland, for a long time, and has written a series of papers for various diseases on the topic. And I think the data pretty much are as evident here. It has a sensitivity that's about... 55% specificity, that's not very good, and negative and positive predictive values and accuracy as noted. So we don't use it because of the low sensitivity and low specificity. And um, but I will note that there are people who believe that it's not useful diagnostically, but has a, has a prognostic significance. So that pet negative cholangiocarcinomas are a better behaving cancer than pet positive cholangiocarcinomas. And there's at least one German group who moves forward with, with a liver transplantation only for pet negative cholangiocarcinomas and not pet positive. The bone scan, uh, we still do them. I'm not sure if UNOS requires it or not but they're, they're useless. This, this cancer almost never metastasizes to bone. The one or two patients I've seen who have had metastases, the bone scan was negative. We picked it up on the CT scan. Okay, so pitfalls in, in taking care of uh, these patients. So these patients all go on extensive neoadjuvant chemoradiation program, which I won't talk about. But uh, they're prone to abscesses, and of course metastases removes them from consideration for transplantation. And here was a patient who was well, just waiting for a transplant. I walked in, and I thought for sure this was uh, metastases. They had this sort of progressive delayed venous phase enhancement. But the biopsy was benign, and uh, we treated him with antibiotics, and he went on to transplantation, and this was non-malignant. Here's another patient who came in, again, felt well, looked well, awaiting transplantation. We biopsied this. It was a benign. The surgeon couldn't see anything at the time of transplantation, but that fact was uh, metastases. So it can be hard. This is uh, an irreversible approach. These patients get a uh, severe radiation hepatitis. Some will develop portal hypertension. They all have biliary tract obstruction. They all get bacterial cholangitis, and they all require stenting by and large. So one of the points is that this radiation necrosis can be apparent on imaging studies. It's often read as progression of the cancer, but in fact it's not. It's just a perihilar burn with radiation damage. So I think the take-home points from engaging in transplantation of this disease is that it's a radial diameter is important, not the longitudinal diameter. MRI is clearly vastly superior to CT for visualizing the tumor but you hope not to see it. You hope to be in an earlier stage. Endoscopic stenting is vastly preferred over percutaneous stenting. Abscesses can be difficult to differentiate from metastases, but they make all the world a difference, and, and sometimes it's just very hard. Radiation necrosis mimics tumor expansion, and the PET scan has a low yield. Thank you.